Hello and welcome to episode three of Chant Talk. My name is Patrick Torsel. In the previous episode, I introduced conducting Gregorian chant, which we call chironomy. In this episode, we're going to dig a little bit deeper into that. Now, I should note that we're really still only scratching the surface on the study of chironomy. There's a whole art and science to it, and my goal right now is to introduce you primarily to the practical art of conducting chant so that you can practice and become comfortable doing the motions associated with chironomy. However, I would strongly encourage you to study the topic more on your own. There's a fantastic book that was put out by the Gregorian Institute of America in 1955 uh, called The Technique of Gregorian Chironomy. It was written by Joseph Robert Carroll, and this book really breaks down what uh, chironomy is all about. It talks about rhythmic patterns, it talks about phrasing, it talks about uh, uh, how to how to notate the chironomy. It goes through everything in a lot more detail than I'm going to be able to cover today. Today, we're just scratching the surface and uh, getting introduced to what it's all about. So, without any further ado, let's head over to the classroom and get into conducting. When we're talking about Gregorian chironomy, we have to remember that there are really two aspects to it. One is an analytical aspect, and the other is the application of the analysis. So we have to be able to break down the chants and analyze the rhythmic patterns, the, the arsis, the thesis, find the phrasing, uh, and then uh, we can determine the chironomy. But then there's also the, the application of that theory, and that's the actual conducting of the chant. And the two are obviously very closely related, but they're not exactly the same thing. The analysis comes first, and then the application. And it's very similar to how I've spoken about Gregorian chant accompaniment as well, in that uh, the more you do it, the more second nature it becomes, to the extent that the analytical part of the process uh, can happen on the fly, and you can open up a, an introit for Sunday and not have to go through the whole pen and paper uh, analytical process. You can do it in your head. I would always recommend that it's still a good practice if you're going to conduct uh, chant to take a few minutes with it before you conduct it and do some analysis. Uh, I think the more time you can spend on that, the better your, your interpretation of the chant is going to be. But it can become a very second nature process so that you can just open up the book and you, you automatically know where the arsis is going to be, where the thesis is going to be. You, you already kind of have a grasp of how that's going to work simply from having done it repetitively. So let's talk a little bit about both the analytical and the practical application. And first, we're going to actually start with something practical. We're going to talk about the hand motions involved in conducting chironomy. Now, we talked in the last episode about the arsis and the thesis. And arsis is the impulse, and the thesis is the relaxation. And so then to apply these, we have the arsis going this way in towards you and the thesis resting out away from you. And the easiest way to get into these hand motions is to use this kind of sideways figure eight that I guess you might call that an infinity symbol. We have the arsis here and the thesis here. And in this figure eight motion with your hand, the beat, the ictus, falls there and there. Arsis, thesis, arsis, thesis. Now we can change the size of this motion depending on whether it's two beats or three beats. So for a two beat pattern, it's a, a smaller circle. For a three beat pattern, we make a bigger circle motion. So if we're talking about all twos, we might have one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Now if it switches from twos to threes, we just get bigger with the motion. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. Then, of course, we also have the possibility uh, of different combinations where one side of our conducting motion is larger than the other side because perhaps on the arsis we have three beats and on the thesis we have two beats. So we would have one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two. Or perhaps it's the other way around. We may have an arsis of two beats and a thesis of three beats. So in this case, we have one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three. And so the important takeaway from this is that the, the simple way to indicate the longer the three beat phrases 
is to make your motion larger. Remember that the ictus, the beat, always B1, always has to fall at this point of your motion. So you can see here it's one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two. One, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three. And that we have to be able to make clear where beat one is falling. And you can, you can even add that little almost, uh, I want to say a little bounce, a little impulse in your conducting as well. One, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Which makes it very clear where that beat one is. So this is a great thing to practice. You can take a piece of paper and draw these figure eights on it and just trace it with your hand until you become comfortable. And remember in the last episode where I talked about leading, not quite from your wrist, but, but from this part of your hand to get a nice fluid motion, and it makes that little bounce very easy. Okay? So after you've practiced this and got very, very comfortable with this motion, the next thing we have to do is to start combining these motions in almost random patterns. Because as we're reading through and conducting chants, these group uh, patterns, I'm sorry, th these groupings of two and three beats can come in any order. They're not always one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, or one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, or one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. They can, they're combined uh, in many, 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 many different patterns. So now let's jump over here to the next board and practice a few patterns. So we have, I just wrote up here randomly, groups of two and three, and I've written whether it's an arsis or a thesis, so that we know which way we're going to move our, our uh, arms here. So we're going to have a look now at these patterns up here, and we're going to conduct them, okay? In this order, slowly, we have one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. One two, one two, one two three, one two, one two three, one two three, one two, one two. Make as many of these random patterns as you can and practice them at different tempos. We could take that a little bit faster too, right? We could have one two, one two, one two three, one two three, one two, one two three, one two three, one two, one two, one two, one two. One, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two. And the more you're able to practice with these different patterns, the better it's going to be, and the more fluidly and fluently you'll be able to read and conduct the differing chants of the church. Now we're going to move over again, and we're going to shift our focus this time to a little bit of the analytical aspect here. So I've written up just the beginning of the Curie from uh, Mass 11, or Bisfactor, which is the common uh, Curiali for Sundays throughout the year. The first thing we need to do is determine our ictus placement. Uh, and there are lots of resources on YouTube and online to help uh, lay out all those rules for you if you're not familiar with them. But I'm going to move through this a little bit more uh, quickly here. We have, uh, let's see, the only notated ictus in the piece is right here. We know that uh, ictus go the beginning of each noon. Okay, so we've got our ictus placed where they belong. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two. And that's the rhythmic pattern that we're going to work with uh, in this section of the Curie. Now, uh, we also have to determine then uh, a little bit of the phrasing of this piece to help us place the arsis and thesis. So we have Kyrie. At least to my ear, and looking at the words and the accents, that's what I hear. Like that. 
Now we can determine where the arses and thesis are placed. Of course, we start on an arses, and I'd say we're already on a thesis. This really just builds up in that key of the QDA. Thesis, thesis, thesis. Okay, now we can back around to an arses as we build into the next phrase. And I'd say we have a second one that continues to build. <laughs> and now it starts to drop back down with the thesis to the end on each beat. Okay? So once we have that in place, we can now draw in the Karatami symbols for arsis and thesis right over the notes. For our second arsis in a row, we'll circle it and head back down around, and then it's all theses out to the end. Okay, and now we have our chironomy written in for the curia. Arsis, thesis, 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 arsis, arsis, thesis, thesis, thesis. Okay, so how is this going to look then and sound? Mm, we'll start on A. And if we were just practicing the patterns, what would we have? One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two. that same process all the way out through the rest of the curie. Now, let's move on over and have a look at the beginning of the asparagus menu. And we'll move a little bit more quickly through this one. So, first things first, let's place our ictus where it belongs. Uh, start from the end over here. And this, by the way, was the only ictus which was notated for us. We start, of course, on one. Okay? So now we want to uh, consider a little bit of, of the phrasing here that we're looking at. Aspergus metomine sopo et so we have a couple of incisors, and we can take each of these incisors, and we can look at its individual smaller phrasing, but then we also have a large phrase here from the beginning until this full bar that we can consider. Let's look at the bigger phrase first, okay? So, and we can look for what I think we could call the, the accent of the phrase, kind of a high point of the phrase. And I'd say, I'd say we're hitting that right around domine. That's where we're building up to. Wash me, Lord. Okay? And so we might have our kind of large phrase here building up right to around Domine. And then it begins to fall back off. Okay? That's the big phrase. Well, that's not going to work. There we go. Now we want to take a look at the smaller phrases that exist within that. We have uh, our first incise, uh, up to the first quarter bar. And it would seem that uh, we could even use the, uh, the word accent a little bit to help us here. So we're building up, and then we're falling back off. It's that whole sense of impulse and relaxation, the arsis thesis, okay? Now, and then we're dropping back off. We might have a little impulse there again, right? Just a little one. And we am going to finish out that phrase. Okay? So we're going to have arsis, arsis. Now as we fall off, we're going to have thesis, 
thesis. We're going to come back around for an arsis here. We're going to have a second arsis here. It's the building thesis. I think we're going to have another arsis here on East Sobo. This accent here. And I think we're thetic to the end. Okay, then we come back around, of course, for another arsis to begin this next phrase. Okay. So let's go ahead and draw in that karana. taking us all the way out to the end on this thesis, okay? Now, of course, we would uh, have, because of the, it's hard to draw because where I put my words here, but we would have a rest here, two beat rest, because we begin on beat one, okay? And so that could be conducted as well. La, la, okay? So let's have a look at what our Quranomy looks like for the Asperges May from the beginning. Asperges May Domine Sopo Et Namor Lava It's a little bit hard for me to do it at that angle. I apologize if it doesn't look quite perfect. But, um, Another thing that we want to talk about there then is what about these guys? When we have these horizontal uh, samas which fall, especially in these three beat patterns, that's uh, it's, it's a little bit difficult to get that across uh, just by the thesis. And so you know something that I have done, and, and we have to remember here again, uh, as we've talked about in a variety of circumstances, that you know karanami is a means to an end not an end in itself. It has a purpose, and its purpose is to lead the singers in chant. We conduct to guide the scola, right? And if you have the advantage of perhaps working with your scola on a daily basis, uh, it's not that difficult really to get them into the mode of, of understanding the Quranomy and, and watching very closely for how long you're holding it out. So if we came to that, Et they should be able to follow that. If, on the other hand, you're only conducting the scola once in a while, uh, or you have new singers all the time who aren't familiar with uh, Quranomy as, a, as an art and a science or with your particular conducting style, you may need to give them a little bit more direction on that. And what I tend to do, and this, there's no right or wrong way, I think, to do this. This is just what I tend to do, is um, I, I borrow a te conducting technique from uh, modern conducting. So when I come to those horizontal descends over three beats, we have Edmund And so I'm just giving almost like it's a three-four pattern. One, two, three, and then the last thesis, right? And that just gives them that little bit of extra direction they need. There's other ways you could do it. That's how I do it. But just keep in mind that your goal as a conductor is to uh, guide and lead the scola. So if they don't know what you're trying to convey, then either you need to explain what you're trying to convey so that they understand it, or you need to make your conducting more clear so that it fulfills its purpose of leading and guiding the school. Okay? So the last thing we want to do is see how that looks when you put it all together and conduct a chant. Let's head up to the choir loft. Oh, spare, just my...